Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I do want to uh, encourage you to pick up copy of Slime Incorporated, my first detective novel. Really great to actually write a full-length uh, detective story and uh, combine some of my knowledge of Idaho. We tell a story of mystery and intrigue set against the backdrop of the Idaho governor's race. It is available as a Kindle book or also as a paperback. So pick up your copy of Slime Incorporated. Now it's time for today's episode of the Casebook of Gregory Hood, The Eloquent Corpse. Petri Wine brings you The Casebook of Gregory Hood. Tonight, the Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine, invite you to listen to the story of The Eloquent Corpse. Another exciting adventure from the casebook of Gregory Hood. Uh, but before we get started, I'd like to tell you about one swell dessert. Chilled fruit with Petri California Muscatel wine. It's really wonderful and so easy to fix. Just put chilled fruits in a dish and pour chilled Petri Muscatel wine over them. That's all there is to it. And is it good? You just couldn't ask for anything better than Petri Muscatel with chilled fruit. Just be sure you get Petri Muscatel. Petri Muscatel is such a fine wine, beautifully golden in color, with a marvelous, full, rich flavor. Believe me, Petri Muscatel is really good. And you can serve that Petri Muscatel proudly, because those five letters, P-E-T-R-I, spell the proudest name in the long history of fine wine. Petri. Once again, it's Monday night in San Francisco, and time to hear another chapter from the casebook of that celebrated importer and man about town, Gregory Hood. Tonight's story begins in a small and shoddy waterfront bar in San Francisco, a bar affectionately referred to by its regular customers as Bottleneck Bill. The barkeep, a gentleman by the name of Bill, stands talking to his only patron, a small, softly spoken man who sits on a bar stool opposite. How are you friend, Larry? That'd be okay, Bill. Yeah, what's new? That's something I want to show you. Go ahead, the place is empty. Get a load of these. Ever see coins like that? Hey, what kind of crazy moolah is that? All screwy shapes with funny letters on them. Uh, what are they, lad? That's what I want to find out. I took them to a hawk shop on market, but the guy acted kind of funny, so I screamed. I got a hunch they're worth big dough. Where'd you get them, Larry? Now, you know better than to get curious like that, Bill. Okay, so they're hot. You know, I don't handle that kind of stuff. Take it easy. I'm not asking you to handle it. And why did you come to me? Because you know people, and I don't. People that can be useful. Play ball, Bill, and I'll cut you in. What's the deal? You know that guy, Gregory Hood, don't you? Sure, I know him every once in a while. And all this old-fashioned, hearty, crafty stuff is his racket. He'd know what it's worth. If you think he'll fence for you, you're crazy. He's strictly on the level. All I want from him is information. You want me to take this stuff to him? Uh-uh. He's still a rat. He might call in on the cops. <laughs> this stuff's red hot, Bill, and it's liable to pop like dynamite. I gotta dress this up a little. They say this hood guy's a sucker for dames. I figured we might send, uh, might send Norma. Wait a minute, Larry. 
Norma's my girl. Sure, sure she is. But all I'm asking to do is go and see this hood guy. And I got the whole thing doped out. Now, here's what we'll do, Bill. And I bet he falls for it. Oh, how do you do, Miss Haywood? Sit down, won't you? Thank you, Mr. Hood. Oh, would you like a cigarette? No, thank you. Mr. Hood, I've come to you because I'm told you're the one person who can help me. Well, I'll do my best. What's the trouble? Well, I received a package through the mail today. This coin was inside it. May I look at it? Yes. Thank you. I could see it was old and probably valuable, so I brought it to you. Well, I'll say it's valuable. This is a perfect specimen of 16th century Korean money. There's no mistaking it. Oh, if you want to sell this, Miss Hayward, I'd be very happy to buy. Well, that isn't exactly why I came here, Mr. Hood. Oh? Huh? I want you to help me get hold of the rest of them. The rest? You mean you have a collection of these coins? Read this note, Mr. Hood. I think it will explain everything. It came in the package this morning. Oh. If you want the rest of the collection, come to Bottleneck Bill and ask Larry. Mr. Hood, I'm afraid to go there. It sounds like some sort of... Let me get a couple of things straight. Had you ever heard of this collection of coins before? Never. And I don't know anyone named Larry. Oh. Well, if it's a trap, why bait it with a valuable coin like this? I don't get it, but I'm mighty curious. Then perhaps you'll keep Keep that, that date for you? With Hayward, I can hardly wait. <laughs> Hello, Bill. What will it be? Let's have a glass of sherry, please. Okay. You haven't been around lately, Craig? No. What's new? Oh, uh, mighty little. Huh? This is sherry. Thanks. Bill. Uh, uh, yeah. You know a guy named Larry? Larry? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's sitting in that booth over there. Said he was expecting someone, only it was a dame. Well, he'll be disappointed. How well do you know the guy, Bill? Well... He's new around here. Been in a couple of times, that's all. Think he's okay? Yeah, I'd say so. Seems to have plenty of jack. Talks smooth. Not necessarily the hallmark of a good citizen. <laughs> Much obliged, Bill. Yeah, you're welcome, Greg. Larry? Yeah? I know I'm a poor substitute for Norma, but I'm keeping her appointment. Norma Hayward? What do you know about her? Recognize this coin? Huh? Who are you, mister? The name's Hood. Gregory Hood. Why did Norma go to you? Mainly because I'm in the importing business, I guess. She wanted to know if the coin was valuable. Is it? Certainly is. I'm curious to see the rest of the collection. Okay. Since you're acting for Norma, I'll show it to you. How about coming up to my hotel? Before I do that, Larry, I'd like a little more dope on this deal. Norma said she'd never heard of you or the coin. What's the tie-in? Well, uh... You see, a pal of mine had a crush on Norma. His name doesn't matter because he's dead now. So when he knew he was dying, he gave me the collection. Picked it up in China. He told me to track down Norma and give it to her. Well, what was the idea of sending just one of the coins? Well, he wanted me to check up on her. If she wasn't hitched up to some other guy, then he wanted her to have the whole collection. And you figured that one of the coins would intrigue her. She'd keep the data and you'd be able to do your checking up, huh? <laughs> yeah, that's it, Mr. Hood. Instead of which, you scared her, and she sent me, and I'm afraid I can't tell you a thing about her private life. I well, can wait. Why don't we go up to our uh, hotel, huh? <laughs> You're an expert. I'd like to get your opinion on the stuff. All right, Larry, let's go. Well, Larry, this is one of the finest collections of ancient coins I ever laid eyes on. Valuable, huh? That's indeed. Look here. This copper coin with the square hole in the middle. That's Tian Feng period. This gold penny's English Henry III. Yes, my friend Norma would be a wealthy girl if she ever inherited these. That's the way my pal wanted it. Eh, too bad he died. Hmm? It's too bad he never lived. What? I don't get you, Mr. Hood. Don't play me for a sucker any longer, Larry. I spotted this gag half an hour ago. I was stringing along with it because I was curious. I still don't get Listen, you. Listen, Larry, you read too many whodunits. I noticed your very complete collection of mystery fiction when I first came in. They've overdeveloped your imagination. 
I never heard such a corny plot as the one you dreamed up to get me here. Now, what would my motive be for lying? That's easy. You've got stolen goods. You don't know what they're worth, and before you go to a fence, you want to get an expert's appraisal. So you dream up the idea of a girl as decoy and go into the whole wacky routine. Good, you're a smart man. Thank you. Hmm. But you don't have to be smart to figure this one out, my friend. As a matter of fact, I'm insulted that you thought I'd fall for it. Are you also smart enough to keep your mouth shut? You know, I could make it well worth your while, Hood. Uh-huh. Next move's bribery, huh? Then comes coercion, I'm sure. No, Larry, no dice. If I turned crook, I'd go into the big time. And you're not leaving here. Oh, you want to play rough, huh? Right? Yeah. I'll the side. Why don't you try on this black jack, huh? <laughs> so I read too many detective stories, do I, Mr. Gregory Hood? Uh, we'll see about that. Hello. Give me room 212. Hank? This is Larry. No, oh, I'm in my room. Come up here right away. Ah, oh, don't bring Louis with you. And don't ask questions. We got work to do. Yeah. Yeah, I got someone here I want to get rid of. <laughs> Who is he, Larry? A guy by the name of Gregory Hood. Why'd you let him have it? He spotted my gag. He knows the coins are hot. He turned us in. Why don't we finish him off? No, no need to get mixed up in a murder, that Hank. What are you going to do with him? We'll get him down the fire escape and into your car. And drive him out onto the Presidio and let him sleep it off. Then he wakes up and brings a cop straight here? Nuts to that. Uh, I'm the boss, Hank. What I say goes. Didn't Louie and me help you in a snatch? Well, we stand to go on a spot with you. This guy slaps the cops on us. They'll come straight here. As soon as we got him out of here, I'm checking out and leaving town. Yeah? How about Louie and me? Supposing we don't want to blow town. Maybe you're thinking of going by yourself and taking a grab with you, huh? Well, you lousy double crosser. That was your plan, you're right? You're crazy. Hey, what are you putting those gloves on? So I'm going to finish this guy off. I don't want to leave no fingerprints. I'll give him a couple of jabs with his knife. He won't feel nothing. Hank, right, don't be a dope. Give me that knife. Yeah, try and get it. Give it to me. Okay. Here it is. Oh. <laughs> you always like to give orders. Let's see how you can give them with a knife in your belly. Give me 212. Yeah. Hello, Louie. This is Hank. Look, I'm in Larry's room. Come right up, will you? I don't, uh... I don't think the boss is feeling so good. Hey, Hank, why'd you slice him for? Yeah, he's gonna blow town, Louis. He wants to take the rap. No. You ain't dead yet. Here, help me put these gloves of mine on the other stiff. He dead, too? No, no, no. I relate him out with a blackjack. He's only unconscious. Well, why are you putting your gloves on him? Now, look, you won't get it, Louis, but I figured out a very neat frame for Larry's murder, see? I put my gloves on his hood guy. We scram. I put in a call to the cops. And when they come here, what do they find? You know, I can get that. They find Larry dead with a knife in him and... They find this guy wearing your gloves? <laughs> sure. There are no prints on the knife, so... What did he say? He say this Gregory Hood guy has knocked him off. I'm in the clear. Yeah. Yeah, gee, Hank, that's smart. <laughs> sure it is. You and me will blow town with them coins. Oh, hey, hey, look at Larry. Hey. He's drawing someone on the floor in red ink. Ink? He must have stole when a table tipped over. Hey... It's an arrow. And it's pointing right at Gregory Hood. Well, that's swell. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. You're helping me put the finger on the wrong guy. Hood and Company Importers. Uh, this is Sanderson Taylor. Is Greg there? No, Mr. Taylor, he isn't, and I'm worried about him. I was going to call you. What's wrong, Miss Ferris? Well, he went out of the office just 
just after lunch. He said he'd only be gone half an hour, and he had two very important appointments this afternoon, but he hasn't been back, and he hasn't called. Well, I've known him to switch plans, but he always keeps in touch. Um, you say where he was going? Yes, Mr. Taylor, to a place he called uh, Bottleneck Bill. Bottleneck Bill's? Oh, yes, I know that. So that's a tough hangout. Uh, thank you, Miss Ferris. You're going over there? Right away. Looks like one case of Gregory Hood, but I may have to solve. <laughs> While we're waiting for Sandy to catch up with Gregory Hood, I'd like to make a suggestion. It's simply this. Whenever you're having any kind of peach dessert, be sure Petri California Muscatel wine is on the table, too. Like with peach cake, peach cookies, peach shortcake, or even if you're serving a delicious dish of chilled canned peaches. Believe me, Petri Muscatel with peaches makes a perfect combination. That Petri Muscatel is such a wonderful wine, so clear, so rich and fragrant, that it's just made for peaches. And in nearly every locality, your Petri wine dealer can give you a little recipe folder showing you how to make unusual and delightful desserts with peaches to serve with Petri Muscatel. But be sure you get Petri Muscatel. And our good wine. And now, back to the casebook of Gregory Hood and the adventure of The Eloquent Corpse. As we rejoin our story, Sanderson Taylor, Greg's friend and attorney, is cross-questioning Bill, the owner of the bar known as Bottom. That's all I can tell you, Mr. Taylor. Greg goes out with this guy about 2.30. Uh-huh. You don't know anything about the man except that his name was Larry. Huh? Yeah, that's right. He's only been in here a couple of times. You don't know where he lives? No. Uh, come to think of it, I tell you who might be able to give you the dope. Oh, yeah, who's that? Uh, Dottie Bronson. Miss Larry was in here with her the first time he came in. Oh, I see. You know her address? Yeah, I sure do. Let's see. Uh, 117 Denmark. Uh, that's right off market. Uh, Denmark. Dobby Bronson, huh? Yeah. Well, thank you, Bill. How much obliged. <laughs> Miss Bronson? Yeah? Uh, I'm a friend of Larry. There ain't nothing wrong with Larry, is there? Well, uh, I don't think so. May I come in? Sure. Sure, come in, mister. <coughs> you say you're a friend of Larry's. I ain't never seen you before. And you don't look like his type. Well, uh, I'm not exactly his friend, Miss Bronson. Then why'd you say you were? What are you, a dick? No. No, Miss Bronson. I'm an attorney. And I'm looking for a friend of mine who was last seen with Larry about 2.30 this afternoon. Yeah? How were they? Bottleneck Bill's bar. They left there together. My friend hasn't been heard from since, and... I'm worried about him. Well, I'm worried about Larry. We had a date at four and he didn't show up. Called his hotel room and didn't get an answer for a while. A quarter of an hour ago, I got a man talking. Sound like a dick to me, and I'm scared. Well, so am I. If you give me Larry's address, I'll go over there. How do I know I can trust you, Miss? Oh, my dear young lady, now... Well, well I guess you're okay. I'll give you the address. I'll go over with you, except the cops know me. And I want to watch out for Larry. But... You call me as soon as you get there? Certainly. And don't you worry, Miss Bronson. I'm I'm sure there's nothing wrong. Yeah, yeah. You ain't worried any more than I am. We're both jittering because there's a chill in the air this time of year. Yeah, okay, mister. I'll be waiting for that call. Ah, Mr. Taylor, I was wondering when you'd get here. Oh, Sergeant Barton, uh, what's the homicide squad doing here? Plenty, and we're lousy with clues. They're even marked out on the floor for us this time. Uh, come in, Mr. Taylor. Yes, yes, thank you. Is Greg here? Yeah, but he's still napping, Mr. Taylor, and the police surgeon's working him over. The surgeon? Oh, thank you, easy, Mr. Taylor. He's okay. Who's on this kid? Lieutenant Silver. Yes, it's a good thing I am. Greg's in a jam. But what's happened to him? He's out cold, slugged with a blackjack. But he's going to be okay. Yeah, but what happened, Lieutenant? I'm not sure yet until Greg can start to talk. But you can take a look for yourself. That dead body on the floor with a knife in his belly. We checked his identification. Larry Masterson. He lived here. And Greg's lying beside him. How is he, Doctor? He's coming to. His lips are beginning to move. Uh, what? Well, gee, how, how do you feel, Greg? I was as if I dived headfirst into an empty swimming pool. And I got a good hard skull. 
Mighty glad to see you, old Sandy, old bloodhound. Had you trail me out. Here, Greg, let me give you a hand. Uh, 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 Lieutenant Silver. And Sergeant Barton, too, this old home week. Let's hear your story, Hood. If you mean who slugged me, it was a guy by the name of Larry. And if you look behind you, you'll see the body of the man in question, neatly stabbed through the belly. Holy smoke. While you were unconscious, Greg, somebody must have come in here and stabbed him. Hey, where'd I get these gloves? I wasn't wearing them when I came in here. Well, somebody must have slipped them on you uh, after you passed out. There's another puzzle, Greg. Huh? Look at these diagrams in ink on the floor. And notice the red ink on the dead man's finger. Yes, the S with the lines through it. But well, that's a dollar sign. Yeah. Mary's made an arrow. An arrow that was pointing at exactly where you were lying, Greg. Yeah, but the arrow also points to this other drawing. Pretty crude, but it looks like a lighted pipe. Obviously, the dead man is trying to leave a message the clue to his murderer's identity. Ah, uh, maybe so, Greg. I haven't much faith in those kind of things. Well, Lieutenant, you can be sure the dying man didn't do that doodling just to amuse himself. Stan, how did you hear of the murder? We got an anonymous phone call telling us to come up here and we'd find a body. Oh? Well, I think I see it. The killer thought he'd frame me by putting these gloves on me, knowing that a smart murderer uses gloves. Then he'd put in the call for you, figuring he'd walk in and nab me. Well, it's possible. But I've got to look at facts, Greg. And that arrow was pointing straight at you. Oh, oh, Lieutenant, you can't suspect Greg. I can suspect anyone in my business. You never know what a man might do when he's cornered. Stan, you have a nasty, suspicious mind, and I'm going to prove it to you. The dead man was a whodunit fan. Yes, I noticed those mystery books on his table over there. Therefore, he knew about dying message gags. Well. He tried to leave one by drawing those ink stains on the floor. After he died, the killer spotted the message and put his gloves on me. The gloves he'd worn when he stabbed Larry. He planned to pin the wrap on me. Prove it to me, Greg. That's all I ask. You've got to prove it, Greg, to get yourself in the clear. Oh, no, I... uh, ooh. Oh, wait a minute. A dollar sign, an arrow, and a pipe. You know, could be I've got it. Who is it, Greg? Get me a list of the dead man's friends, guys that were close to him. When I got that, I think I can point out the killer. List of his friends? Yeah. Okay, but that's going to take time. I think I can speed things up a little, Lieutenant. I tracked Greg here tonight by talking to Larry's girlfriend, Dottie Bronson. Let's go and call on her. I bet she'd be glad to help. Oh, come on, come on. Take it easy, Daddy. Well, we got him. How'd they do it, Hank? Oh, somebody sliced him. You sure he's dead? Sure, I'm sure. Oh. Talked to the hotel manager and he talked to the doc. I'll just get my hands on that guy. And maybe I can. You'll stick with me. They get the rat that wiped out Larry? You can bet on it. That a gal. You want me can go places, Daddy. You're a smart kid. I'll lay off at Hank, will you? Larry ain't even in his cat. I'll go see who it is. Uh, what do you guys want? Some information? Why? Lieutenant Silvers of Homicide. The dick, huh? Come here to tell me that Larry's rubbed out, I guess. Thomas Bronson, obviously you know that fact. We've come here so that you can help us find his killer. So are you. I know your friend. He's the attorney at law who forgets to make phone calls. Uh, well, I'm sorry about oh, that. But... Skip it. I asked you who you were. The name is Hood. I think I was the next to last person to see Larry alive. Ain't that pathetic. Did you bring a copy of his will? I'll take it easy, Daddy. We're here to help you. Yeah? Well, who can help me now? You'd like to find out who killed Larry, wouldn't you? Sure. What can I do? Now, listen to Mr. Hood. Maybe you can help give us the clue to the murder. Sure. I'll polish up the crystal ball. Shoot, Mr. Hood. What's the $64 question? A simple one. Give me the names of Larry's closest friends. That's easy. I only had three. Or close. Me, Louie Horton. Who's Louie Horton? Oh, he's a dumb lug that wouldn't know which end of a knife was sharpest even if he sat on it. They worked with Larry. And who was the third friend, Miss Bronson? It was... it was me, Lieutenant. And what's your name? Jackson. The first name, Mr. Jackson? Henry. I wouldn't by any chance call you Hank, would they, Henry? Sure. Everybody calls me Hank. Why? There's your man, Stan. He killed Larry Masterson. Oh, you're crazy. No, I think I'm quite on the beam, considering the crack of my dome a little while ago. What's your alibi, Hank? If I needed one, Dottie here could give it. I was here with you and Larry was bumped off, wasn't I, Dave? Well, I... What time was that, Hank? About 2.15, wasn't it, Dottie? That's an interesting alibi. The best the police surgeon could say was the guy died somewhere between 2 and 3. 
We didn't find the dead body until about 5.30, and we haven't released a word about time yet. Yeah, you're a little too ready with your alibis, eh? Now, listen, mister, I don't know nothing about this. No, sir. nothing except that you killed him. Yeah, try and prove Sure I will. The gloves you planted on me had a slight flaw. There was a hole in the right thumb. There was a thumbprint on the knife, and it wasn't mine. It was yours. We checked it. Yeah, but Greg... Wait a minute, Sam. How's about that fingerprint, Hank? Which way was the print pointing, Mr. Schmack? Towards the blade. Sure. But if you stab a guy, the print would point the other way. Only if it were a downward blow. This wound was up from under the heart in the best professional stabbing manner, which means that your print was just where it should have been. But there wasn't no holes in those clothes. Anyway, the arrow was pointing at you. That's enough, Hank. How did you know that if you weren't there? Well, I... I, I you dirty lout. I was lying when I gave that alibi for you. I ain't seen you all day. And I hope I never see you again. Now, what do you say, Hank? We've got you every way. Okay, okay. All right, I killed Larry. He was trying to double-cross me. He had it coming to him. Ah, take me away, copper. I don't like the company you keep. Well, Greg? Well, Sandy? I can understand you're wanting a drink, but... Did we have to come back to bottleneck bills? Well, we came back for two reasons. I wanted to get an aspirin, and this is where I came out on this deal. Uh, I'd like to round out the cycle. Mm -hmm. You know, Greg, I still don't understand what that dollar sign is. Well, it wasn't a dollar sign, Sandy. Well, that's the way I learned it at school. You make an S and draw two lines for it. Very true, but it might also be a way to cross out the letter S. The arrow pointed at the shank of the lighted pipe. Cross out the letter S and shank, and you have Hank, the name of the murderer. Oh, yes, of course. Another thing puzzles me, though, Greg, um... How, how did you have time to check the thumbprint on the knife hand? Well, Sandy, there was no thumbprint. No? And there was no hole in the glove. I just said those things to scare Hank into a confession. Well, Greg, you scared the daylights out of me today. <laughs> me too, Sandy, but don't act mad. Well, I am mad. You walked into a trap, a trap that was clumsily baited. That's not like you. Yeah. Sure, but the bait was juicy. Anyway, there's no great harm. Though. Oh, but there might have been. You down here got killed and nearly got framed for murder. All for the sake of the firm, Sandy. Uh, the fr oh, now, Greg, don't try and tell me you walked into this deal today because you were thinking of a business. Sure I was. Hood and company could have come out of this mess very nicely. That was quite a valuable collection of coins. I'll be proud to return them to their owners. Very altruistic, but uh, we should stop playing cops and robbers. I'm sorry, Sandy. And I'm darn grateful for your help. Just the same, Sandy, promise me one thing. Huh? Why, well, sure. What is it, Greg? Don't let's quote this little adventure. After all, I spent half of the case as an unconscious suspect. <laughs> no, Sandy, this will be an unpublished chapter from the casebook of Gregory Hood. Greg, you got through safely that time, but you're awful lucky Masterson left that clue. Well, oh, yes, Harry, but of course there's always a clue somewhere if you can find it and figure it out. Yeah, but deliver me from figuring out clues as tough as that dollar sign in the pipe shank. Well, you could do it. Now, don't kid me. Well, sure you could. For instance, suppose you're sitting at a table. Mm -hmm. On the cloth, someone has drawn with a pencil, not a dollar sign, but a cent sign. Yeah. And an arrow pointing at an empty wine glass. Ah, light dawns. It's about Petri wine, but uh, what about it? Oh, easy. An empty wine glass calls for some good wine, doesn't it? Yeah, but that sense sign... Look, Harry, if you want good wine, what is it that makes sense? Oh, brother, was I slow on that. <laughs> well, slow or not, it does make sense to order Petri when you want good wine. Petri wine has just got to be good. You see, the Petri family has been making wine for generations now. The art of making fine wine is a heritage in the Petri family, passed on down from father to son, from father to son. So just think of all those years of skill and experience that go into making Petri wine. It's no wonder Petri wine is so good. And it's no wonder the Petri business has grown and grown until today the Petri family is America's largest independent winemaker. Yes, the making of Petri wine is a family affair. And the Petri family has every intention of keeping it just that. So you know the name Petri on a bottle of wine is more than a trademark. It's the personal assurance of the Petri family that Petri wine is and always will be good wine. <laughs> The 
Casebook of Gregory Hood is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher. Original music composed and played by Dean Fossler. Elliot Lewis plays the part of Gregory Hood, and Sanderson Taylor is played by Howard McNear. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. The Casebook of Gregory Hood comes to you from our Hollywood studio. This is Harry Bartell saying good night for the Petri family. For a solid hour of exciting mystery dramas, listen every Monday on most of these same stations at 8 o'clock to Richard Davis, Private Investigator, followed immediately by the Casebook of Gregory Hood. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. This was a kind of confusing episode. For the first uh, thing, I did not like the intro. It was a little confusing without Gregory Hood there, and then Gregory Hood was there at the end. Though Elliot Lewis did probably of the people I've heard here, Gail Gordon and uh, Nigel Bruce and Elliot Lewis, Elliot Lewis did the best job at feeding the commercials. And then there was that reference in the middle of the story to not recording the case, and I was like, okay, good thing this isn't going to end up on the radio, preserved for posterity, and listened to uh, several decades later. Um, uh, It, of course, gives you the idea that, well, maybe there was a Gregory Hood book, and this was not included in, in the Gregory Hood detective series. Well, the confusing thing here is that there was no actual series of the casebook of Gregory Hood. It was original to radio. It was a bit odd, and overall, I prefer the more traditional uh, structure. This one was a how catch em and not necessarily the best, but we'll see if uh, it uh, we get a better story next week. All right, well, on to listener comments and feedback. And Justin from Jersey comments on the site. Uh, I have to say that I love the case book of Gregory Hood. It's a nice detective series, and I enjoy both Gregory and Sandy. Also, thank you for keeping the Petri wine ads. While I understand they aren't everyone's cup of tea, I like that you kept the ads in, as to me it preserves the show was meant to be heard. Uh, thanks for your insight and your hard work. Well, thanks so much, Justin. I don't always um, include the ads. There, there are a few cases where I'll edit something. But uh, in this case, I actually think the ads are, are are somewhat classy, the way that they are done in this uh, series. And I've always uh, enjoyed the kind, of, the kind of back and forth. And Harry Bartell is just fantastic at uh, being just incredibly personable. But thank you for your comment. And W. Vogel says, uh, thank you for the programming. Well, you're welcome, and uh, thank you so much for listening. That will do it uh, for today. We will return tomorrow with the Primrose Matter, parts three and four, and then join us back here next Tuesday for the last existing Elliot Lewis episode of the Casebook of Gregory Hood. In the meantime, you can leave uh, the show a voicemail at 208-991-4783 and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.